a couple of occasions yes. and there's still a lot more work to be done before I personally am going to draw any concrete conclusions. But we are seeing behaviour that we normally associate with brain behaviour coming from a crystal. This is what I believe. This is very interesting. Well, I know you've got this and a lot more experiments uh, at early stages at this time. There's clearly a lot more work to be done and I'm only waiting for the day when we can start to apply some of this technology at the great crystal stones. Now this suggests that somehow or other the nature of crystals is that they can enhance or absorb the effects of human consciousness, that they are consciousness receptive. Now if this is so, and if we can go on further to really confirm these early uh, experimental results, then we may have here, locked up in these sort of megaliths, some form of consciousness communication, perhaps from a remote period. Maybe it's some other form of consciousness altogether, but one of the priorities of Earth Mysteries research at the moment is to really try to understand what the secret is in these crystal megaliths. Uh, this stone is Menantol, the whole stone, and it's in the Land's End district of Cornwall. It has two great legends associated with it, two traditions. One was that local village people would come to the stone and consult it as an oracle. And the way that divination worked was that the wise person from the village would come to the stone with two needles and place them crossed on the top of Menantol. Then the person seeking the advice of the stone, of the oracle, would ask the stone the question. And the tradition was that the needles would acquire a peculiar rotating motion. And it was the skill of the, uh, of the seer, of the wise person, to interpret those movements of the needle and give an answer to the, to the supplicant. The other great tradition associated with this whole stone is that it had great healing properties. And this is a tradition associated with a number of megalithic sites. And people researching into Earth Mysteries feel there may be some truth in this old tradition, this old legend. The other great tradition associated with this stone is that it has healing properties. And this is a legendary motif associated with many megalithic sites. And Earth Mysteries researchers feel there may be a grain of truth in this legend. In the case of Menantol, what would happen would be that the sick person, usually a child, would be passed through the hole of the stone three times. And uh, in some versions of the tradition, uh, the, the ill person, the child, would then be dragged on the ground around the stone. Some people say three times, some six, some nine, but the magical numbers. Uh, a particular disease that this was said to cure was rickets, a sort of bone disorder. It was very common in the Middle Ages. Now, these two traditions may have a common factual derivation. We know today in modern medicine that healing, particularly of bone disorders, can be accomplished by the use of small levels, pulses of electromagnetism. It does help the healing of bones. The nature of, of what was carried out here as a healing process, plus the divinatory use of moving needles, possibly hints that there is some unusual or special magnetic quality about this stone. So maybe there are low levels of electromagnetic fields around the megaliths at some time. And indeed, from research done on the Dragon Project and other research programs, we do know and we have measured that stones like Menantol can, on occasion, give sudden shifts and changes of geomagnetism. So maybe there is some truth in this healing legend associated with this ages-old stone. Lays or ley lines are straight alignments of holy, sacred or special places 
laid out in remote antiquity in many places around the world. Lays, in their simplest definition, are alignments of sacred sites across country. And we find the earliest versions of these with the old stones, the megalith sites of, of Northwest Europe. Uh, but we find similar sort of arrangements in South America and the Andes, uh, such as Bolivia and Peru, where we have ancient tracks on the ground linking old Indian shrine sites. The word lay was coined by Alfred Watkins of Hereford, because he was the first to clearly articulate the observation that ancient sites fell into straight alignments. But he was, in fact, only part of a whole understanding of the ancient landscape being laid out in this way, wasn't it, Nigel? Yes, yes. There are many, many people before Watkins who talked about alignments and, and had various theories for them. And, of course, there is the connection between alignments and solar and lunar phenomena, which may not be lays. For instance, a line which runs to the horizon from a stone circle or from a church, which may have one or two sites upon it, but may not be technically a lay. Also, there are other kinds of problems with lays, in that uh, people have suggested that they carry energy, or that they are spirit paths, or that they have other sorts of characteristics, which Watkins himself did not put down mm. as being lays. He thought they were, in fact, old trader's routes, didn't he? That's Laid right. down about 2000 BC. Uh, and being a businessman himself, perhaps that was the natural interpretation he put on yes. to these, these remnants of alignments. And in, in the British Isles, where, where he did all his work, he didn't expect to find the tracks still left on the ground. He found remnants of old straight tracks, and in fact, that's what he called lays also, old straight tracks. He suggested that really we were looking at the ruins of these alignments, yes. and mainly discernible only by the positioning across the landscape of ancient sites. But it's not just uh, the old stones and earthworks that align, is it? We're no. finding alignments of ancient churches, medieval, middle-aged churches. And in Cambridge we have the Seven Church Lay with the round church at the, at the northernmost end of it. And the round church itself represents the centre of the world or the cosmic axis. And the cosmic axis itself had the pole star at the top of it, just like the uh, star on top of the Christmas tree nowadays represents that. And so worship towards the north was carried on even after Christianization occurred, although people had become Christians in religion, they still used the old relation to the landscape for their sacred sites, and so we get these alignments which reproduce the former tradition of layout. This is the Castle Mound at Cambridge, and it is a perfect example of an evolved site. This place has been important for people for a period of time beyond memory. This mound is a Norman castle, almost a thousand years old. Once upon a time, it would have had a wooden palisade at the top. But that mound stands on the site of a much earlier Roman settlement. The Roman settlement, in turn, was on top of, superseded, a late prehistoric site. So for thousands of years, this point has been considered important, particularly from an administrative point of view. This point is also at one end of another sacred line that passes across the city of Cambridge. And this line ends on the far side of Cambridge at the prehistoric earthworked hill known as Wandlebury. It crosses the Cambridge Seven Church Lay at Holy Sepulchre Church the Round Church. I'm sitting on the wall of the Round Church, the Holy Sepulchre, which is the beginning of the Seven Church Lay and also rests upon the lay which runs from Castle Mound to Wandlebury. The lay runs to St Michael's where it forms the East Wall. Beyond that it goes to Great St Mary's, then on to St Edward King and Martyr, St Bennet's, St Botolph's and finally through the site of the city gate to St Mary's the Less. This church is also upon the alignment which runs from the Castle Mound through St Clement's, through this church, then through two other college chapels and several other important geomantic sites to Wandlebury. 
In the case of Glastonbury, there's another link. You see that the, the main axis, looking down from the church at the west end, mm -hmm. down the axis of the abbey, mm -hmm. down that strange old trackway called Dodd, Dodd Lane, Lane yes. you'll get to uh, that church on the rock called Gower Hill, about 20 miles away, mm. and that thing will point towards, doesn't it? It goes pretty well towards Stonehenge. The foundation, the legendary foundation of Glastonbury Abbey and the first Christian foundation there was meant to reproduce the image of a paradise. Mm. And it was designed for that purpose to represent uh, um, the idea of paradise above, transferred to earth. And I think that, that the, the myth of, of St. Joseph and the original Christian foundation there, going back to the very beginning of the Christian era, um, no doubt it, it was renewed at that time, but I think that, that it harks back to an even earlier myth, and even earlier times when, when that particular plot of earth was as sacred as, as it became later under Christianity. It seems to me that that, 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 that legend of Glastonbury's foundation is a Christianization of an even earlier myth, an earlier which recognised a natural sanctity of that place, which is not a Christian mm. convention or any other mm. convention. In the turn of the century, Sir Norman Lockyer, uh, the father of archaeoastronomy, surveyed Cornwall, and he, when he surveyed the site, he found an outlying stone that indicated an astronomical position for, I think, May Day sunrise. In 1974, John Michel, surveyed Land's End also, looking for extended alignments or ley lines. And he found that there were four more stones in a dead straight line beyond the one that Lockyer had seen. So this stone circle has a row of five standing stones radiating out from it. At least two of those stones though are now damaged or removed from the, the alignment since Michel discovered them but it is a classic case of a ley line coming up to a stone circle. Well, I was attracted to that area because it's, it's almost an island. It's an isolated area at the very far western end of England, and it's geologically different from its surroundings. It's a high granite plateau. It's about um, eight or 10 miles square, no bigger than that. And yet on this small area is an absolute profusion of ancient monuments, going back to Three, four thousand BC. Who knows? Um, and over that whole area, there's a wealth of stone circles, standing stones, dolmens, as well as the more natural shrines, the holy wells, the um, early relics of of um, of visionary Christianity, when the Celtic saints set up their hermitages in the wild places. Now, this country has always been attractive to hermits, pilgrims, uh, holy men, saints of all sorts. And it's got layers over it of history, of sacred history from all periods. Um, and as I was studying this area, it became apparent that there is a kind of order among the prehistoric monuments, that you have, say, stone circles from which radiate alignments of stone. Now, this is beyond the peradventure, and they're, they're placed with extreme accuracy. Very often said you can just see the next stone in line from the previous one. So this whole area received a kind of pattern over it. This stone is one of the two Piper stones, not very far from the Merry Maiden Circle, and an alignment taken out from the Merry Maiden Circle through this stone, this one of the, the two Pipers, can be extended on to a further stone that John Michel discovered a couple of years ago, 1984. Um, and he discovered that stone, worked out its position, found it to be exactly on this alignment. So here we have another stone circle, Merry Maidens, with an alignment of, of standing, standing stones radiating out from it. But what have they meant in the past? I mean, every great church, cathedral, sacred place of all sorts, they've always been pilgrimage places. People have made journeys to them. At the end of their journey, They've seen some wonderful things, whether that's some relics, whether they are phony or not, they, they seem to work nonetheless. And the people got cures, uh, blessings, and a very good journey. In fact, it took the place which tourism has today. Mm. Yet there was probably more point in it, because at the end of it, there was um, some virtue. <laughs> and it's traditional that people go to certain places yeah. for a kind of regeneration, as well as for the pleasure of the journey. Yeah. 
um, whether certain places have have uh, certain powers in this way um, is, a, is a, a moot point. Of course, we know that certain, say, holy wells, springs, and so on, uh, do have curative powers. The waters themselves. But there's more to it than that. I think the uh, experience of going to the place and, and taking part in the journey is in itself, uh, is a, an end in itself, is a therapeutic experience in itself. Here we have a situation where these enigmatic dolmens may mean something. You can walk, let us say, a dolmen is eliminated two weeks before winter solstice. That is the walking distance from that dolmen to a major meeting place, a major solar construct. So the dolmens that are around the countryside in Ireland and England and Britain are, represent places where the tribes could see when the sun is coming in. It represents their calendar. And then they, they could walk to Stone Age. Stonehenge, or, or, or walk to uh, Newgrange, or walk to uh, Lockroo Mountains. But it gave them a time. It, it, that was their computer. That was their uh, time base. That showed them. When the sun shone in there, that showed them they should start walking towards it. People realize we're dealing with a sort of synthesis of energies of places, of sites, of many different factors coming together. And so we do get this idea that it's quite popular today that lays and ley lines are these corridors of energy and so on, yes. which they may well be, but not quite in the sense of a power line in the no. way that I think people interpret it at the present time. When they tend to see it as being immutable, that, that it's just running there, and no matter what you do to it, you can't alter it. And yet, of course, the very fact that something like a church is built upon it is specifically to alter the quality and the character of a site, to enhance the character that it had, and to, Im to make it uh, possible for people to access that power. And so the geometry of the building and its location, its orientation, and the time it's founded, and everything to do with it, will be an enhancement of the quality of that site. So we see, with the practice of geomancy, what we're seeing is a sort of interaction, if you like, of planetary fields and human biofields. Yes. And into that comes the, the correct direction the timing, perhaps planetary positions, a whole range yeah. of variables that have to be balanced and matched at a particular site. The subtlety, the complexity of the geomantic act. From earliest times, Glastonbury has held a unique place amongst the sacred sites of Britain. It's associated with Camelot, King Arthur and the Round Table, Avalon and the Crystal Isle. A place of visions, healings, mystical initiations, a gateway to the other world. Shortly after the crucifixion, it is said, Joseph of Arimathea and a group of 12 holy men came from Palestine and brought the Holy Grail to Glastonbury. Here he founded the world's first Christian church. This is the Chalice Well in Glastonbury. Legend knows it is the healing bath of Camelot. The actual source of the well is unknown, but it's supposed to flow down from the Mendip Hills north of here. The 
the water chalice well contains a heavy iron content which accounts for its red colouring. The cover of the well is wrought iron. It was designed according to its ancient pattern and restored to the well by the architect Bly Bond, who in 1908 was given the task of reconstructing Glastonbury Abbey. The symbol of the interlocking circles is called, in Christian terminology, Vesica Pisces, which means the vessel of the fish. The fish, Ictus, was, of course, the original symbol of Christ and also of the Piscean Age, which saw the beginning of Christianity. But we find this very same symbol of the vesica in all sacred geometries. It forms the ground plans of prehistoric stone circles like Stonehenge. It's found in the geometry of the Great Pyramid, in Hindu temples, and many other ancient sites throughout the world. This is one of the fundamental figures of sacred geometry. The waters of the well are said to have life-enhancing quality and people come here and take the water for healing. Like all holy wells, Chalice Well is a, is a feminine place, a place of the earth spirit. Here at Chalice Well, you can strongly feel its yin energy, that feminine element of the earth force. What is geomancy? It's a word which is being used today and kind of bandied about in a number of different ways, but literally geo means earth and mancy means divination. Literally means divination of the earth. There are two different forms of geomancy. One is a kind of oracular geomancy, which is done by things like coffee grounds or leaves, throwing bones, getting signs uh, about a condition on the earth whether it's hunting grounds or uh, if a place is healthy to live in, this can be done by an oracular method. This method of divination, all methods of divination, by the way, are methods which connect the unconscious mind to the conscious mind. And this is always done by a medium of like uh, throwing bones or reading clouds, the flight of birds, things like that. But Geomancy is uh, to locate the places uh, in landscape ge geomancy, which we are con uh, considering in, in detail in this particular presentation, has to do with the idea of placing your structures, your building structures, your temples, your homes, your seats of governments, your healing centers on places on the surface of the earth where what the Chinese call qi or ki, that is vital bre breath or energy, is upwelling from the earth through um, geological factors and water factors. And these places where the qi or ki would upwell are places that animals recognize. Uh, animals will sleep on these areas. They will give birth on these areas. In the natural landscape, you'll find, for example, birds will, will sit on them. Uh, gnats will circle around over these areas. Ant hills will uh, develop over these areas. But ancient man built his structures, his sacred sites, uh, things like Stonehenge or Avebury, again, over these sites so as to enhance and amplify whatever ritual or scientific measurements were being made at these places. Geomancy is a way of shall we say, reading the Earth's body language. Uh, what is the Earth doing at this point? Is this point an energy sink 
or an energy source. You want to build over an energy source. That way you get the uh, complete benefit of the Earth uh, adding to whatever function you're going to uh, carry out at that site. So geomancy has this kind of uh, universal application. We find geomantic sites, sacred sites, throughout the world. We find, uh, for example, uh, megalithic structures. And by the way, megalithic literally means large stone structures. We find them not only in England, we find them in Spain, Portugal, Germany. We find evidence of them uh, in Africa, in Morocco. We find evi evidence in areas like Kenya. We find evidence of megalithic sites in Polynesia. Uh, there are stories of some in Mexico, stories of some in Australia. We're dealing with a, a worldwide phenomena. Uh, Bronze Age, which is about 2500 BC to say maybe 1500 BC. Uh, we are finding a wide distribution of uh, megalithic sites. In England, where I have done most of my work, we find some 900 stone circles scattered throughout the British Isles. And those are only the stone circles which are still extant today. Behind me is King's College Chapel, which is one of the greatest geomantic buildings in Britain, if not in the world. It was originally founded in 1446 as the chapel of a college founded by King Henry VI, who was a very mystical king. He gave the dimensions of the building and the college to his master masons so that they would reproduce sacred geometry precisely in the building. And although the country underwent a very serious civil war and the king himself was murdered in prison, the dimensions of the building were continued right the way to its completion in 1515. Um, the building itself is laid out on a system of geometry called ad triangulum, which involves the use of equilateral triangles making the famous symbol called Solomon's seal. It underlies the entire structure of the building. The building itself also has certain measurements in it which have mystical meaning, and the whole thing is sited in a place which has some of the greatest geomantic power in Cambridge. Sacred geometry is the idea that you take proportions of a human body. In the ancient days, it was usually the king was the standard of measure. You would take uh, parts of his hand or uh, length from the tip of the fingers to the elbow or the length of his stride. And these were in Egypt, for example, called like the royal cubit. And you would take these distances and then incorporate them into the structure you were building. For example, you would take uh, a, a, a cubit, or in the megalithic system, a, a unit has been uh, isolated called the megalithic yard. The megalithic yard is uh, something that Professor Alexander Tom, uh, professor of engineering at Oxford University, after 40 years of surveying ancient sites, uh, found after lengthy analysis that there is a this megalithic yard of 2.72 feet, plus or minus 0.003 inches. And he said, those old boys must have been engineers because it took an engineer to decode what they did, because that is engineering accuracy. This length of the megalithic yard is found in the diameter and circumference of over 500 circles that he has surveyed. The idea of sacred geometry is something that Professor Tom looked at in great detail. It's something that John Michel has looked at in great detail in his work as well. Well, I think probably places like Glastonbury Tor, which is an absolute natural landmark, yes. where centers, sacred centers in ancient life, around which people traveled and migrated, going back to days of before settlement, mm. that there are certain places all over the country, which the various, which the tribe who, who lived in that country would regard as their little paradise, their sacred place, and so on, and they'd pursue their annual journey around it, and it would be the dwelling place of the gods, and so on. So it became mm. uh, invested with particular sanctity. Yes. Well, we can we can know this, don't we, because of the prehistoric trackways, the Mm -hmm. The swamp roadways, mm. causeways mm. that were built there, what, 2000, 3000 mm -hmm. BC. Mm -hmm. 
and with the with the stone earth goddess figurines found underneath uh, one of them. Uh, so obviously the area has been treated as a as an area of sanctity for for all mm -hmm. human memory for mm -hmm. all practical purposes.